ready, man? Party people in the place to be. Uh -huh. It's about that time for us to. Yeah. What's up, chiropractors? This is Dr. Nick Silveri, your guide up the mountain to a million dollar practice. If you're looking for the roadmap to grow your practice fast, then keep on listening. This is the Path to a Million podcast where I chat with today's most successful practicing chiropractors. And remember, if you want to get there faster, visit GetMeMoreNewPatients.com to find out more about Leverage Media, the most comprehensive digital marketing agency for chiropractors on the planet. What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Nick with Leverage Media. Welcome to another episode of Path to a Million podcast. This is a very special episode. Um, I have Dr. Margie Smith on with me, the original Polish princess, the, the big sister. <laughs> I never asked for it. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Quite the introduction. Good. Yeah, yeah, right. You got a special one. No one ever gets the... Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I feel, I feel special. You're welcome. Um, so Margie is one of my favorite people in chiropractic. Uh, we met uh, maybe a year or so ago, and uh, she is also a Chicagoan and, um, originally, and so we kind of bonded on that, and uh, we've become fast friends. So I wanted to uh, introduce friend. you to the audience, and uh, I, I feel like we, you know, we are working on a, a special project about uh, how people can be more successful in practice without all of the stress. And so why don't you give people a little uh, introduction of who you are, where you've been from, where you came from and uh, what you're up to. <laughs> well, I came from my mom. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for that absolutely breathtaking um, introduction, Dr. Nick. I really appreciate that. Very sweet of you. Um, I am Margie Smith. I am originally, yes, from Chicago and I love talking about Chicago. So that's why Nick and I are friends. The only reason why we're friends is because he lives okay. there. Um, and um, so originally from Chicago, born um, and raised in the city and uh, went to college in the Midwest, did undergrad in Midwest, and then went to chiropractic college at Logan, um, graduated there in 04 and shortly after graduation, opened my first practice. So that was kind of my kickstart in, kick into chiropractic. Um, I didn't work for anybody else before. I didn't have an associateship but I sure did a ton during chiropractic college to set myself up for opening my first practice in downtown Chicago, um, which was great. It was an awesome, really great experience. Let's real quick, real quick, just cause I, I like to get the like details of like how you set yourself up for success. So like for the students out there that are, that are thinking like, what should I be doing to, yes. to get ready? What did you do in, in chiropractic school? So when I started chiropractic college, I didn't have like a amazing life-changing story about how chiropractic saved me. I found chiropractic as a job that I thought, or a career that I thought would suit me and what I felt was important about health. I thought I was good at helping people and connecting with people. So I thought it would be a really good career path for me. So when I got into chiropractic college, I didn't really know that too much about it but I did become really excited about being a part of chiropractic, a part of the profession. And so I think like anything that you get excited about, when you go around and you start seeing, you know, chiropractic offices like around town or on vacation, I'd see a chiropractic office, I would just walk into them. Mm -hmm. And I just randomly started walking into chiropractic offices no matter where I would see them. And I quickly started learning how to get to know chiropractors. They would invite me in. Uh, take a look at their practices, share their paperwork with me. And then I kind of figured, well, I should just do this during my trimester breaks. I will find another part of town, another part of the country if I'm visiting, and I'm gonna make a list, a goal to meet different chiropractors and go into their offices. And, um, and I did that and I kept like a Word document of the things I liked in chiropractors offices, things I didn't like, um, ways that they would communicate something with a patient I really would find interesting. So I would write down those communication um, strategies and tools and I would just shadow offices nonstop. I probably shadowed 20 different offices while I was in chiropractic college. Very nice. So what was your, what was your favorite thing that you saw in an office? What was your least favorite thing that you saw in an office? Let's see. You know, not being exposed to chiropractic, very much of chiropractic before college, I thought the first time I saw a really tiny, small little baby get adjusted, I just thought that that was like mind blowing. Yeah. Um, so I remember 
the first time that happened was like, holy cow, this is way bigger than I thought that it was going to be. You know, yeah. I thought it was going to be a job. And in fact, it's going to be something that's going to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> I think one of the worst things I saw was, or maybe not saw, but experienced was it was a chiropractor in the Bay Area here, not far from where I am now, who just straight up looked me in the face and said, do not become a chiropractor. Definitely don't move to this area. This area sucks. Like he was just like the most negative chiropractor I had ever met ever. Yeah. And so um, maybe not something like terrible that I saw per se, but that was just like a, that was kind of an interesting experience, let's say. For sure. Yeah. All right, so you got a chiropractic school, you open up downtown. Yep. Regular practice, getting Regular out practice. there and hustling. Yep, I, I opened in on the north side of Chicago in a neighborhood called Lakeview, which is um, not too far from Wrigley Field. In a one mile radius of that practice, there were 25 other chiropractors. And so I, of course, you know, I'm excited. I'm out of college. I'm opening my first practice. Um, and I went through the process of getting a real estate agent and a bank loan and um, getting a space. And because I didn't have a ton of money, I mean, I got a loan, not a huge loan, but I was able to get a bit of a loan to get started. Um, I didn't have a lot of, I couldn't get a gigantic space. So my first mm -hmm. office was only about, you know, 800 square feet. It was a second floor suite of a building. So I didn't have any storefront. I had no signage. Nobody knew that I was there unless I put myself out there. And so I thought I would start by meeting, you know, my brothers and sisters in chiropractic, and this is going to be so great. And they were so nice to me when I was in school. And it turned out that once you graduated, in my experience, they were not as nice. They were not as welcoming. Um, in fact, out of the 25 I had gone and met, only two of them were actually gracious and nice and welcoming. And to this day, one of those chiropractors is one of my closest friends in chiropractic, and she's absolutely amazing. Um, What's her so name? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Mage, who's still Shout practicing out. in that area. Shout she's, out to Dr. Stephanie, good job. She's amazing. She's just one of my favorites. Look at me, I'm blushing, but just talking about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so I had to get out there and I had to learn real quick, how am I gonna build my practice? How am I gonna fill my practice with um, patients. So I started doing, um, you know, the very, the all popular spinal screenings. I'd go to whatever gym would let me do a spinal screening, screening, and I'd stand there with my old school SAM unit with the, you know, the the bars that you had to lift up and the the plumb lines and all that kind of stuff. And um, and then I became involved in the Chamber of Commerce. I went to networking groups. Um, essentially, if I was not in practice seeing patients, I was outside of the practice with business cards, meeting people, shaking hands, letting them know who I was. Got it. So how long did you have that practice? I had that practice for two years. Two years. And then what happened? And then um, we just got tired of living in Chicago. So my husband and I um, sold our, our condo, so sold the practice, uh, packed up a how truck. Large did you, how large did you build up the practice to? Built up the practice, what do you mean? Numbers wise, how many yeah, patients? Yeah, like visits, I was, I was seeing about 125 a week. Okay. So it wasn't like a like a gigantically you know crazy large practice, but it was about 125 a week that I was seeing when I sold it. Okay. Okay. Um, so the uh, so you sell the practice and you guys move to where? Um, we moved to San Diego. Oh, but wait, real quick, I have one more oh, quick sure. story about how I built the practice because I okay. find that this is I think a unique story. Um, I also would take my spine with me places, like my dry spine that I had trimester yeah. one. I would take it, like I would just go get coffee and sit there and have the spine sitting next to me. Or I would take it, like go get lunch and have it sit next to me and people would come up to me and they would be like, what are you doing? Why do you have a spine? I'm like, oh, I'm a chiropractor. Have, do you know about chiropractic? <laughs> I would just start talking to people that way. So, so I've never, I've never heard that before. And I think that is such a good idea. That is a super big icebreaker. I was one time walking down the street with my spine, a guy pulls over and he's like, he says, are you a chiropractor? I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you have a business card? I said, yeah. And I handed him a business card. That's great. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, all right. Um, all right. I, I'm glad you stopped me for that. Cause that's a, that's a good tip. 
I swear, hand to God, but true story. I used to I do that. I believe it. I believe it. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say you like went to a lot of Polish weddings and just handed out your business card. But I mean that too, that too. But yeah. they all wanted me to adjust them right there at the reception, right. and you know that's not right. <laughs> right. All right. So, uh, uh, so you moved. Where would you move to? We moved to San Diego. San Diego. That's right. That's right. Yes. All yes. right. So walk me through that. Did you start a practice there? So we moved to San Diego. Um, we obviously moved there because it, you know, felt like an amazing place to go live. And my husband's father, so my father-in-law lived in San Diego. So we felt like that's nice. We have someone there. And so I wasn't again, again, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. So I um, had a couple of friends that I knew from, um, from coaching. So um, a coach that I had used when I was in my Chicago practice was Dr. Steve Hoffman. And Steve Hoffman lives in San Diego. So he connected me with a bunch of people in that area. And so I got to, um, I got to meet some of the people who were kind of like the big leaders down there, Dr. Matt Hubbard, Dr. Brian Stenzler, um, Tim Gay. And so I started kind of going to these different meetings and groups and core meetings and CCA meetings. And I started covering some practices because I wasn't really sure if I was going to open another practice or what my deal was going to be. And some people had um, needs. So I started filling in. I started covering some offices. But when I started, when I would cover these offices, I gave the chiropractor the choice. Listen, I can, can just come in and be a coverage doc. No problem. Here's my fee. But if you would like me to come in and maybe give you some insider tips and tools on how maybe you can improve things in your practice or what things I see might need some improvement, I can do that as well. And that's just a small additional consulting fee that I would charge on top of that. So it actually started working out really well. And I was covering a bunch of practices. Um, I ended up going up to um, Dr. Bill DeMoss and Dr. Brad Glowacki at the time had this, um, this was before CalJam, before um, any of that started, before like New Patient Maven that they do now, he does now. Um, they had this like nuts and bolts seminar that they ran in Orange County and they invited me to come up um, and I was able to present to this group of chiropractors. There was about 75 chiropractors in this group and I was able to tell them about myself, tell them about my coverage services, how I was different. And then I started getting some offices up in Orange County that I would cover as well. So I did that for about maybe about a year and a half before I said, oh, I'm going to get back into practice. Let me do my own thing again and get back into practice. But from that in that practice, I was actually an independent contractor in um, a chiropractor's office by the name of Dr. Matt Hubbard. And so he and I, he had one location. He was hoping to open another location. So I helped open that second location, but I still worked under like the umbrella of his office and his practice. Gotcha. Um, so you worked there for a while. Worked there for I worked yeah for a year, and then I found out I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Well, I found out I was pregnant while I was in that year, but I worked there for about a year. Had my oldest daughter, and at the time thought, oh no big deal, I'll go back into practice. This will be great. And then after she was born, I said, no, I don't want to practice. Yeah. So um, I ended up selling that patient base of patients that I built up. Um, to Dr. Hubbard, and then I stayed home with my daughter. I wanted uh, time to be a stay-at-home mom. Got it. For a couple. And of then, uh, just just so that we can get to like the real good value, let's right. speed through the like where right. I, I you know I know what the end of the story is. So right. so you decided to go back into practice. Now, currently. No, no. Like at some point, you decided to go back after you had stopped when you got right. You know, so I off. had um. I had some kids and we kind of moved around to a couple of different places, which made it difficult for me to start another practice again. And then knowing that we would be out of that town. Um, so we moved a couple of times and then we finally ended up where we live right now. And I opened my current practice about three and a half years ago. And we moved here about four and a half years ago. And, but I, I find it interesting, like how you started the new practice, you know, it was, you were going to do it on your terms and so right. talk a little bit about that okay so i we moved to town where we live now and we live in northern california um my husband travels for work a lot most of the time during the week i am not able to 
um, count on help in the mornings or afternoons or activities or things like that. So long story short, I have to be the number one person for my children if they need something here, you know, in town. So you have, you have, you have three children under the age of? Three, and my oldest is turning 10 next week. Yeah, okay. So they're very um, fun, cute, healthy, but very busy, very active, very social, do lots of activities. So um, I, after about a year of living here and kind of getting to know the town and meeting people, um, I started feeling some demand to start practicing again. I had a bunch of people who would constantly ask, hey, when are you getting into practice? Please let me know. I really need a chiropractor. There isn't one like you in town, you know, blah, blah, blah. So. Um, my husband and I at the time were saving a little bit of money off to the side for my future chiropractic office, but I wasn't planning on opening anything for a couple of years. But we kind of decided, you know, if I could find something that could fit our lifestyle and fit where I have time in my day, then let's try and let's check it out and see what would happen. So um, I decided I wanted to, but I decided I wanted to be a business owner. I didn't want to be an independent contractor. I didn't want to be an employee. I wanted to be my own business owner. Um, but I was hopeful that I could find a space in another chiropractor's office. Yeah. So just yeah. wanting to rent a room, pay that chiropractor a, a room fee, and that's it. And everything else would be separate. My patients, my scheduling, my collecting, my billing, whatever, I would all do on my own. And I ended up kind of creeping around town to all the various chiropractors and would just kind of present my case. Hey, I moved to town. I'm new. I'm looking to rent a room. Do you have anything that you'd be willing to rent? And so then I had about three chiropractors who were negotiating with me, you know, different rental rates and stuff like that. And I ended up renting where I am right now. Great. Yeah. So now you practice how many hours a week? So I practice, I'd say about maybe about 12 hours a week on really busy weeks. Maybe I'll be here about 15 hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always like the additional like paperwork time that I may spend at home, maybe in the evenings or mm -hmm. early mornings, et cetera. But I'd say maybe like on average, maybe about 12 hours a week. Yeah. So when I, uh, you know, recently we've you know been talking about your practice and um, and that I just thought there was uh you know like a a need for it in the market of, of everyone you know all the coaching groups are always trying to help you grow the biggest most successful practice which you know is you know everybody has a different definition of what success looks like but you know it usually leads to more more uh more appointments more staff more money more headaches more stress and uh all those things are great if that's what you want but if it's not what you want you know i thought that there wasn't really anybody speaking to the people that were like you know, like I would maybe like to do something like what you're doing. And you said, you know, you, you've spoken before. It's about this kind of like um, in a roundabout way. And people are all like always resonate with it and come up yeah. to you and, you know, are like, hey, you know, do you, do you coach on this? Do you teach this? Da, 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 yeah. da. So, um, so that brings us to the point of, of this conversation. Um, so you and I are working on a, on a project called the micro practice, right? Yes. And, um, and so you are going to become the teacher and the coach and the leader to people that are looking to have a lower overhead, low stress practice that fits with their lifestyle, not trying to fit the lifestyle around the practice. Correct? Correct. Correct. I'm doing a great job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Yourself um, back. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about like, the, the the avatar like who are the people that that this would be a great fit for so i just wanted you to kind of walk through some of those different situations and like i guess why it would be you know uh, great for them so um a, a great story or a great example that i have to share to begin with is um so when i started renting the space that i'm in right now um about three years ago i was actually renting from another chiropractor um dr mike he had a practice, you know, brick and mortar, and just happened to have this one room open that was all storage. He opened the door when he was showing me around, and I said, hey, if you just empty this room, I'll rent it from you, right? Super amazing guy, super sweet guy. Dr. Mike ends up selling the practice about a year ago to another chiropractor, Dr. Kat. And so she bought the practice and 
she asked me if I wanted to continue to rent from her and I happily was because I had no other plans of going anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so the funny thing is, is that when Dr. Mike sold his practice to Dr. Cat, he was moving to Nevada and now in Nevada, he has a micro practice of his own. So nice. he's now <laughs> renting space in a gym in like, you know, like a personal training kind of a gym. He has his own room, his own space, and he's building his own practice, his own micro practice. And he did that specifically because he watched me in my practice. And he said, that's exactly what I want in my practice. He had been in, he had been in chiropractic probably, I think, 23 years around that time. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was just really getting sick of the hustle and bustle and the staff and the overhead and the billing and the insurance and all the little, you know, things that kind of build up over time. He was just getting super sick of it. So um, that that's a great example of somebody who can really benefit into considering a micro practice for their practice. Obviously somebody who is like me, I am a mother of three children and um, a wife and that's my big priority, but I still love and adore practicing and I want to practice, I want to work. Um, I have such passion for what I do for, in chiropractic. So myself, this is an ideal setup for what I do because my practice is all about my life and my patients know that. I have, a, I have pictures right here at my desk of my family and of my kids. They walk in, they know straight up in the gate who I am and what I focus on. And if I have patients scheduled and then I have to call them or text them and say, hey, you know what, actually I'm gonna go on this field trip with Ella next week. Um, so I'm gonna move your appointment to a different day. Never once has a patient barked at me. Nobody's ever given me a hard time about it or said anything bad about it. They're like, oh my gosh, that's so great. Yeah, go on that field trip. Yeah, we'll see you the day after. So I just have built this great practice of people who just really um, you know, resonate with what I do and what's important. Um, so that's obviously a great person, somebody who's maybe struggling in their current practice. Maybe they opened a practice years ago with the hope and dream of having this great career and make tons of money. But again, you know, opening any kind of a freestanding practice means that you're going to have an overhead, considerable overhead with regards to your rent, your utilities, your insurance, your um, wages that you have to pay, employees, uh, managing employees, are you, do you have associates? You know, all of that, again, is great, but then you have to work that much harder to fill that gap of making sure that you're covering that, plus taking home a really nice income as well. Um, so I would say this would also be really super great for a student coming out of school. You know, had I known more about this when I was a student, I would have attempted to do something more like this. Not that I didn't love my first practice, I absolutely adored it, but this today is a super great way to come out of school, you know, gain as much experience as you can in school, but come out of school, start slow, start little, start building. And you know what? The great thing about this is that if you do build it to a point where you are, you know, doing really great, then you can unplug your micro practice out of where you are and then you can go and open a larger, you know, freestanding practice if you'd like. So there are so many different possibilities with regards to who this could fit for and then where you can take it from here. I, I think that's great. And I, I agree that, you know, just because you start out in a micro practice doesn't mean that you can't evolve into a larger practice. But it's, you know, I always, whenever I talk to uh, newer doctors or sometimes I'll talk to students and I'm like, you know, the, the best thing that you can ask for in business is a choice. Like you get to choose whether you go to work. You get to choose whether you see this patient. You get to choose whether you hire someone. Uh, a lot of a lot of doctors, I just don't think are they don't have a lot of choices. Like they've kind of built the prison that they are now totally. in, and, and they're, then they're, to. you know, they're kind of like uh, you know they're just. It's like they now are certain now they have a job. You know, I talked to. Um, uh, Stephen Franson and, and Pete Camiolo about this with a remarkable CEO. And they, you know, they talk a lot about, uh, you know, do you have a job or do you have a business? And there's a, you can, you can own a, you can own a company and have a job. Right. And, uh, and I think that the, the nice part about the micro practice is that it's so low overhead. It's so lean and mean that it allows you the, the options to, to do things that you want to do. 
Lean and mean. I like it. That's you. That, that describes you. Lean and mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get that tattooed. Okay. Yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like people don't realize how much you bully me, and, um, <laughs> and so I'm hoping that they'll they'll get a sense of that today. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so we have we we've, we've worked hard on on a presentation that that you give uh, quite a bit. The five secrets um, to running a what do we say? It's like the five secrets. What's the name of it? It is five secrets to running a low overhead, stress-free, highly profitable practice. Who doesn't want that, right? Who doesn't want that? So let's walk through those. Give me, uh, give me secret number one. Secret number one is what I would say um, is to set it and forget it. So I have systems like automated systems, like you wouldn't believe in my micro practice. Um, I obviously cannot be adjusting a patient, have the phone up to my ear, and then my hands on the computer scheduling people all at once, right? So each one of those aspects of how a patient will interact with me in a practice, in any practice, I looked at and I wondered how can I make this automated so that I don't always, it doesn't always have to fall on me and my shoulders. Um, so everything from the way that my patients schedule with me, most of my patients will schedule themselves online, and I have my online calendar opened up so that they can directly schedule there. And that pops up on my calendar and I know what to expect. And that's how we work. Um, to um, the way that um, payments are run, for example, I don't run payments every single time I'm adjusting patients. I have that set up so I automatically run those payments. You know, they either automatically run on them themselves or I run them at the end of the month, et cetera. So um, that's the big first one is get the systems in place to be able to set things up so you don't have to do every single thing. A lot of people sometimes get um, freaked out at the thought of not having a staff because the staff does so many of these things. But in th this day in technology, there are so many things that we can have done for us without having the staff there necessarily. That's great. Uh, secret number two. Secret number two, I say, is to talk about money. Um, so many times um, chiropractors, I find this is one of the most awkward conversations with patients is to talk about money. And I am very upfront with my patients about what it, what it is going to cost for them to come into my practice. I also don't accept insurance, except Medicare, because I can't see a Medicare age patient if I'm not, you know, if I don't participate in Medicare. But otherwise, all the rest of my patients are cash only. And so not only do I sit down with them at the, at the report of findings and give them what the finance breakdown is going to be, but before I sit down with that, I have to do a hell of a job building the case for that financial expectation that they're going to get. So by the time they're sitting down with me and we're talking numbers and money, I have not to this, in the last three and a half years that I've been in this practice, I have not had one patient be like, <gasps> it's going to cost that much money. Like nobody, nobody is surprised. Everybody knows what my fees are. And so if I'm telling them that we need to see you twice a week for three months and then weekly for another three months based on your health status, what I found to be um, my experience, what I think that you're going to need and what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Well then yes, it's no surprise that I'm going to need to see you 30 plus times over the next six months. Here's how we can pay for it. So I do that up front, and again, nobody's ever barked at it, nobody's ever made a big deal about it, but I find that once you just get the money talk done with, then you can focus on what's important, which is their health and helping improve and reach their goals. And, and with the, uh, and not just like talking about the money, but then also automating that so that- Correct. They're not having to reach in their pocket every visit. You know, they're exactly. buying their plan, they're doing the, the payment plans, and so they, they just have to buy one time instead of, every time they walk in the office deciding if they're gonna, uh, this is a good deal or not. Correct, so every time, so the talk about the money and the set it and the forget it, the first two kind of work hand, hand in here, hand here because not only will I present for them what their clinical report of findings are, but then financial report of findings, once I present that included there is the different options for how they can pay for it. So I never make my patients choose anything specifically. If they want to go pay per visit, by all means, you can choose that, but I'm going to still hold your credit card on file. I'm going to run it at the end of the month and you're going to pay full price for every visit. 
if they choose a payment plan, which 95% of them do, then okay, then I can give you a small discount if I run your card monthly. I can do a little bit more of a discount if I do a down payment and then smaller monthly payments, or I can do a, a greater discount if we do prepay all at once. So I give patients pretty much four different options as to how they can pay for their care in the, in the practice. I in fact had a patient two weeks ago who was so grateful that there were these options because she had been to another chiropractor who only would allow prepays. The chiropractor would not allow any other option to pay for care except for prepayment. And she was really nervous that that's what I was going to do as well. And so I could just see her like wait, you know, fall off her shoulders when I gave her these different options. That's great. All right. Number three. Yes. Number three is keeping the overhead bar low. So obviously in this kind of a setup, my overhead is, I mean, my overhead is probably one tenth of what my overhead was when I was in my Chicago practice, which that one was with staff and, um, you know, not only rent and insurance and, you know, utilities and all this other stuff, it was a big overhead. And I had to see a lot of people to be able to clear that overhead every single um, month. Now my overhead is so low that I only have to adjust 30 people a month to cover my overhead. So anything over that is just gravy. What would you, if you had to guess, what's the percentage of profit in? Currently, in my, my profit percentage currently is at about 65%. It's pretty great. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. And if, and you, wanted to, and if you wanted to expand hours, it's not like there's any extra cost in like adding five more adjusting hours onto it. So that would all be more profit. Right. Correct. And in fact, that's a great thing that you just brought up. That's exactly what has happened to me the last couple of months because my youngest daughter just went to kindergarten. And so now that she's in kindergarten, I have Monday through Friday from 9.30 a.m. until 3 p.m. available. And previously, I didn't have that before because our daughter was not in like a full-time preschool. So now I have more. And so I have kind of picked up a couple of you know, extra hours here and there that patients have asked to come in. And it's been really nice because like you said, that's just gravy on top of everything else. Because you can only <laughs> yoga brunch and spa so much, you know. I mean, come on, I still yoga <laughs> brunch and spa. <laughs> that's true. That's I'm true. not going to cut that out. No, yeah, stop it. I'm no, I'm not saying you have to cut it. You're teasing. He's teasing me. I don't do that that often. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, uh, so, okay. But as far as my overhead goes, yeah. you're looking right now, this is my room. This is the space that I'm in. This is what the room that I'm renting. Um, it's a beautiful, huge room. My adjusting table is right behind me. Some tools that I use with patients uh, are behind me. And this is it. But because I'm, I'm a part of another chiropractic office outside my door, there is a lovely waiting area with coffee, tea, and water for the patients and fresh fruit. There's a little um, kids area uh, just on the other side of that wall that has books and crayons and toys and things for kids to play with. So it's nice. It's not as if I'm just kind of in this like small closed off like closet. I have this great space, but again, the overhead is just, the overhead is super, super low, which is great. And there, and there are French bulldogs playing around. So you can't beat that. There is. We do have an office dog. He's a French bulldog named Bruce Lee. Nice. He's sadly not here today, but yes, we do have a dog as well. He's our mascot. Um, all right. So secret number four. Uh, secret number four is just to be the doctor. In a practice like this, I have had such unbelievable results with patients because I, again, I don't have to take on as many patients as I may have had to um, a long time ago in practice. And the nice thing now is that I get to select and choose who I want to work with. And it's not to say that I don't want to work with everybody, but at the end of the day, my time is limited. And so if I do want to only accept the cases that I think that I would be best at, then I have the freedom to be able to do that without stressing out of like, oh gosh, there goes, you know, part of what could have covered my rent. Right, and right. 
the beauty of it is because we have such a nice tight network of chiropractors in the area that I work, that I live in. Um, I quickly will just refer patients who I don't think are a good fit for me. I'll refer to some other chiropractors in the area. And we kind of do that with one another because that's just, that that's just kind of better for the patient in the long run. So it's mm -hmm. nice. I get to connect with my patients. I get to know about them. I become kind of a part of their families. Um, I, my girls get invited to, uh, my patients' birthday parties all the time. Um, I get to, uh, so recently I see a lot of pediatrics in my practice. And so a lot of kids that go to school with my kids are patients of mine. But of course, because of HIPAA, I can't go home and tell my girls that their friends are patients of mine. But inevitably, these friends will come to my girls and say, oh my gosh, your mom is my chiropractor. She's so great. Oh, she's so awesome. And, you know, and they'll, they'll say something nice about me. And then my girls will come home and they'll say, well, oh, mama, I didn't know that, you know, so-and-so is a patient of yours. And what's nice about that is that it gives my girls, it gives my family this sense of pride that we're kind of a part of the community. And what I do, it has this big of an impact on them that I've got little kids running up to me at soccer games, Dr. Margie, Dr. Margie. And, you know, they're just, they're just, you know, it's just, to me, it's one of the most heartwarming parts of all of this is just seeing mm -hmm. the impact that this has for people where I live. So I love it. I get to just be the doctor and not stress about all that other business necessarily. Which is, I think what most, uh, you know, chiropractic is, is kind of a tricky thing because you know, people always, I think they always assume that chiropractors are like natural born entrepreneurs and that's why they became chiropractors. But the, I think the vast majority of, of chiropractors became chiropractors to be a doctor, more so to be a, sure. than to be a business owner. And For they just sure. get forced into it because there aren't a, gr a lot of great options on how to uh, like work within a system where you can just be the doctor. Right. And, you know, if you run a practice like mine, I had to stop being the doctor because I couldn't deal with all of the things that had to be done and be the doctor at the same time. So it is, I, I think that that's a, uh, a really refreshing, um, like, option, I guess, for, for especially, like, people that want to do something very niche specific. So I um, lately have been getting on a lot of calls with uh, with younger female doctors that want to really focus in on pediatrics, which is odd. Like I just did an uh, interview with uh, with our mutual friend Tony Ebel, mm -hmm. and you know he runs a massive practice that's seventy. Totally. Like, I think it's a thousand people a week, and it's seventy percent pediatrics. And it's that's a macro a, that's practice. Exactly <laughs> the macro of a macro. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great that that he wants to do that, but there. Like there are lots of people that would just love to see 50 people a week, take it nice and easy, have a family, like, or just, you know, be able to, to do whatever they want to do. Um, but still be able to, you know, make a good living and, uh, you know, not have to, because I just don't think most, I, I think that most chiropractors are not really like purebred entrepreneurs that love the game. Like I love the right. game of entrepreneurship. Um, I don't think that a lot of them love the game. They love being a doctor. Well, they, I think a lot love, you know, love the idea because the game ultimately will get them that impact and what they do and the service that they provide their patients, et cetera. But I think that what happens is a lot of them will get into the game and say, oh gosh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. You know, we are unique in other, you know, such as other healthcare professionals like, you know, a surgeon, for example, a surgeon's obviously not going to open their own practice for the most part. They're going to go work at a hospital, make X, Y, Z. They don't need to worry about the business. They just get to go in and they get to do, you know, what they do technically. Yeah. We are on the way opposite end of that spectrum. And you're right. There aren't a lot of options that are available to us that we aren't responsible for creating on our own. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, if, if there was, if there were chiropractic hospitals where people could go and make $150,000 a year, they would be packed to the gills. Totally. They, they would have waiting lists of chiropractors that wanted to do that because that's all they all, it's what they all want to do. Not all, 
but it's it's what I think 70% of chiropractors would, if you could just get a guaranteed 150 and just be able to, to focus on your patients, right. that you would trade that in a heartbeat for all the, the stress that comes along with trying oh, yeah. to figure something out that you're just not like naturally inclined to. And it, you know, it sucks that those options aren't really out there. That's why I'm hoping that, you know, eventually like the, the associateships can, I was talking to Todd Pickman the other day and he mm-hmm. was in an associateship uh, early in his practice where he was making, like he was on pace to make, I think almost $400,000 because he was bringing in a million dollars a year for this practice. And he just like, he's just an entrepreneur. So like he eventually wanted to go out and try it on its own, right. on his own. Naturally. But there's lots of people that, that don't, they're like 300 grand to be an associate. Yes. Like that sounds amazing. Right. So, or be able to do a micro practice and, you know, well, do it the way yeah. you want to do it. Keep 70% of your money. Not bad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's not a bad gig either. That's right. Um, all right. So last secret, number five. Last secret is how, um, which I think we've kind of talked about, this has been woven throughout all of this, but you essentially get to build your life and you build your life and then you build the practice to fit into that life. So it's mainly even the way that the micro practice was born because I had to build a practice around what could work for my family. And so because of that, you know, I, for example, am not a practice that is going to see um, a patient at 7 a.m. It's just not ever going to happen. I cannot be at my office that early. So there are some patients who need to be seen at that time. And there are industries that go that way that, you know, they have to be at their desk by 8 a.m. So they need to go see, you know, their appointments ahead of time. So I knew that, you know, from the get-go, I was not going to be able to fit that kind of um, a patient necessarily. Um, I built out the, you know, I built out my practice. I built out my life, built out the practice. And then from there, determined what my ideal patient was going to be. And it was based on, obviously, my experience as a chiropractor, what I'm good at, what I know really well. And that is essentially what I have today. I have a practice full of children, families, pregnant moms, um, you know, men too. They come in as well. But, you know, for the most part, I have the practice that I always wanted to. And it's, you know, I didn't realize that I wanted it on this kind of a scale. I always just thought I had to have, you know, the staff and the, the you know, the freestanding um, building or practice and 1200 square feet and all that kind of stuff. I thought that's what I had to do in practice. And so this came on and it's just been a really fun kind of surprise, I'll be honest. <laughs> Well, it's, it's good that you uh, that you fell into it and figured it all out. Now you can help yeah. other people. Uh, to be to be a, a male uh, practice member of of your practice, yes. do they have to get like uh, like uh, three recommendations, like signed letters uh, from right. women come in and uh, right and right and right? They have to, they have to go through a special ceremony um, of like checks and balances to make sure that they can be a part of the practice. Now, of course, they can can come in. (laughs) We just try to like shoot them along. (laughs) (laughs) But I have these like booby traps along the way to see if they can make it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, All right. So we are, we're probably still a few months away from from fully launching uh, the program. Um, We are developing the website, and hopefully by the time that uh, this episode gets posted, we will have the website up and going. So if we post it before, if we post this episode before the website is, is fully operational, we'll make sure that we have a, uh, a uh, you know, like an opt-in box or something, like a, a placeholder. Um, so what, what would the website be that they could go to uh, to find out more information? The website is themicropractice.com would be the one to find out more information. Yeah. And so when, like regardless of what we have on the website, we'll have some type of opt-in to where you can get put onto, it'll end up being a digital course where Margie is teaching um, everything that she knows about running the micro practice, um, as well as, uh, you know, a Facebook group where there'll be a community. She'll be doing live coaching uh, within there. And uh, there'll be a place where you can opt in to get onto the waiting list for uh, for the course when it does go live. But uh, Margie, I just like, it's been so much fun just like developing this and talking about it and brainstorming. And I just think that there's, uh, like I said, there's 
there's no one really talking about this style and i think there's so many people that could benefit from it so i'm glad that uh that that we're on this path together yeah me too it's been it's been great fun i am super excited to see what the future holds it's gonna be awesome uh anything else you want to say to the people before we sign off um thank you for putting up with um dr nick because when you put up with him then that means you could listen to my interview and my podcast <laughs> you're, gonna be, you're gonna be like you're gonna be a couple months into it so they may have like dropped off by then so uh, i know well maybe who knows? Like, like my mom and uh you know like my, <laughs> my mom and your mom that's right my mom and your mom <laughs> uh, well no, Margie, thanks so much for having me i appreciate you uh taking some time for us and yeah. uh Remember the micropractice.com if you want to have a stress-free, low overhead, highly profitable practice, and we will see you on the next episode. Just because this episode is over doesn't mean you can't continue your path to a million dollar practice. We've created Chiropractic's most full service marketing agency at Leverage Media to help you reach $1 million a year fast and continue to grow. You can get a free strategy session with me absolutely free right now. To get started, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com. Once again, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Path to a Million podcast.